Alright, well, it's good to be up here again. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to the book of Matthew, chapter 7, starting in verse 24. Find it to me, Matthew 7, and verse 24. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who built a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents, and the floodwaters rise, and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse, because it is built on bedrock. Lord God, we thank you for your message this morning, for your word, for the foundation you provide us all to move forward, to know what to do with our lives. I thank you, and I pray for your blessing on this message this morning. In your name, amen. All right. Have you noticed this morning that the Bible, as a work of literature, has a bit of an issue with construction. You're just reading through it, you're just minding your own business, you're going through, let's say, Ezekiel, you're enjoying the narrative, the doomsday prophesying, Valley of Dry Bones coming back to life, all good stuff. Cool. Here is four chapters dedicated to the specific dimensions of the temple in Jerusalem. Why? What in the world does that have to do with anything? You're just minding your own business, reading practically any book in the Old Testament, and suddenly you're reading a construction manual for how to build temples or walls or arcs or what have you. It is a consistent theme throughout the Bible to discuss construction and building. What does Abraham do every other campsite he stops? He builds an altar. He takes time out of his day to build a stone monument, or a stack of rocks, whatever it was. What does Israel constantly get in trouble for doing? They keep building altars to the wrong guy, though. They constantly build their idols. They build up their high places so the next king can tear them back down. There's a lot of construction going on throughout the Bible. A lot of work for the unions back then, I suppose. Other reasons why are perhaps natural. Construction is something that humans at any point in history do. Even over here in the relatively less civilized Americas, they still had those big old stone pyramids down in the south. We still got the mound cities over in the east. We've got the <coughs> cliffside dwellers out here in the west. Humans are constantly building. We're constantly using our hands. We're constantly constructing things. And they're perhaps better metaphors than the agricultural <coughs> ones that you get throughout most of the Old Testament. Because we can still grasp the concept of building something. It's a little harder for most of us to understand what it's like to raise goats. That's just not a thing your typical urban American will deal with anymore. A little more so out here in the West, but especially back in the East, you understand the metaphors of construction a lot better than you do the metaphors of working and living on a farm. The statistics is 1% of America grows and provides the food that the other 99% of us eat. There's not a lot of farmers anymore. But when we get to here, when we get to Christ telling us how we should go about building as a metaphor for what we establish our lives on, there is another consistent theme of rock, of stone, of bedrock. Christ is the rock that the builder rejected. You are the stone upon which I build my church. And of course, famously here, if you build your house on my wisdom, you are like the wise builder who builds on stone. Now, how many people here have actually built a building? I know there's at least one, right? I've definitely helped with more than a few. You know, the main thing I have learned, building on bedrock, not fun. <laughs> We don't even have bedrock up here in Mount House. We have hard pan, which is technically not rock. It is clay. It is clay that a backhoe will bounce off of. I have seen it a lot. That big old dumb construction vehicle that can rip through rock like nothing will literally bounce when it hits clay, or bedrock in this case. So Jesus, as usual, is being a really good preacher here with his double meanings. Because, yeah, you build on rock. It's solid. It stands. It's not like sand. It won't wash away. It can withstand storms. But it's not easy. 
There is effort required to build on stone. It is more work. It is harder, especially in a world that doesn't have backhoes yet. So there's a very good message here that an idea worth following, that the wisdom and teaching of Christ is something that is hard, no doubt about it, but once you are there, once you are established, you are firm, you are unshakable, you can withstand any storm. It's the old country song, you have to stand for something or you'll fall for everything. So that's kind of sermon number one, but I think there's more to the more I can do, I should say, with this construction metaphor than just that. Because human beings, again, have been building stuff for a long, long time. And searching back through the Bible, going all the way back to Genesis, one of the first cases I can find, if not the first case, is from a somewhat unlikely source. The name of today's sermon is Cain Built a City. So if you'll turn back the clock, as it were, Genesis chapter 4, you get a second to find your place as I try to find mine. Alright, Genesis chapter 4, verse 17. Cain had relations with his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Not, not the famous one. Apparently they only had a limited number of names before the flood, because a lot of Cain's kids have the exact same names as a lot of Adam's kids. So don't get confused here. But Maybe them after his uncles. Exactly. Cain had relations with his wife, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Enoch. Not that one. Then Cain founded a city, which he named Enoch after his son. I really wish you wouldn't. That's confusing. We don't need a city named New York and a state named New York. We don't need a Kansas City, which isn't in Kansas. And we don't need, like, five different Virginia cities, Eureka's, and Las Vegas's out here in the West. Stop it. Anyways, Cain built a city, named it after his son. Enoch had a son, named Irad. Irad became the father of Muhal. Muhal became the father of Methuselah. Not that one. Methuselah, I guess it is, became the father of Lamech. Not that one. Like I said, there's a lot of re repetitiveness with the names. Lamech married two women. The first was named Ada, and the second was Zillah. Ada gave birth to Jabal, who was the first of those who raise livestock and live in tents. His brother's name was Jubal. You said that already. The first of all who plays the harp and flute. Lamech's other wife, Zillah, gave birth to a son named Tubal-Cain. He became an expert in forging tools of bronze and iron. Tubal-Cain had a sister named Nema. All right, so why am I doing this? Why am I going through all this genealogy? All these names and places that don't really matter. This is the first guy to live in a tent. Big whoop. This guy played music. This guy invented bronze working. Why go through all that? Because it paints a picture, a compelling picture to me, of a world that obviously does not exist anymore, and that, by all rights, we shouldn't even know about. Because what happens to these guys? What happens to these descendants? What happens to the first group of goat herders, the first musicians, the first bronze workers? Flood. The Great Flood happens. This first city of humanity, the first bastion of civilization, the first people to really create what is known as civilization to us, gone. Wiped out. Sincerely doubt we would ever find even the beginnings of a ruin of this. Floods are pretty destructive. Worldwide ones, much more so. So why do we have this? Why do we know about these people? Why does the Bible take time to tell us who they were, what they did, what their names were? Is it really important to us that this guy had two wives? I mean, it's awkward, but I don't think it really matters to us now. Why do we need to know who invented goat herding? Yeah, because that's a hard concept. I get milk and, f um, almost call it fur. It would be fur, wouldn't it? Wool. Wool. Yeah, wool. Well, we'll go with wool. Oh, I get milk and wool from these creatures, and it's easier to do that if I know where they are, so I'm going to catch them and put them in this pen. Not exactly important, groundbreaking information, but the Bible takes the time to stop and paint this picture. 
to give us this image of what was, to give us some names, to let us see what our ancestors, ancestors, ancestors built. I think it's something that you can really have an appreciation for out here in the West. I like to say that I basically, you know those zombie shows that were really popular for a while? The zombie apocalypses where the world ends and you have to go out and live in the middle of nowhere and it's just people walking around these abandoned, desolate cities? I like to say I don't need those shows because that's what I live. I can literally take, what, maybe an hour, drive out of Dayton, find any number of completely abandoned ghost towns. Nevada has about 500 of them. And these aren't just ghost towns. Almost every single one of them, at one point, was the richest city in the world. Virginia City is, of course, the famous one for that. But there are these pockets, these little desolate ruins of what was once a thriving, booming town. The place to be. And they're little more than dust now. Just a couple old creaky boards and stacks of stones vaguely resembling a house, sitting out, wearing out in the desert. Man can build what he likes, and in a lot of ways we are told to. But we do need to keep in mind how temporary it all is. How our greatest accomplishments are eventually going to be nothing more than ruins, sitting out in the sun. And that's us out here in the West. Those ruins, a lot of them aren't even cowboy days. A lot of them are from the 1920s, 1940s. There's a lot of boom towns that sprung up to support the war efforts and ended as soon as we didn't need them anymore. Imagine living somewhere like Europe, where, yeah, I can walk down the road and get to this thousand-year-old castle that's still standing out there. That primarily tells me that Europeans are better at building things than we are, because ours are already collapsing after only about a hundred years, and theirs have been sitting there for centuries. Humans sometimes put too much of importance on themselves. I don't think that's a surprise to anyone. The famous poem, Ozymandias, Look at my works, ye mighty, and despair. King of kings, lord of lords. On just simple little carved stones sitting out in the desert. Signifying nothing, meaning nothing. Happens to the greatest empires eventually, but there is more of a point to that than just my typical ramblings on history. Verse 23 continues the story of Cain's descendants. If I can find my place again. One day Lamech, not that one, said to his wives, Ada and Zilla, hear my voice. Listen to me, you wives of Lamech. Don't talk in the third person, dude, that's creepy. I have killed a man who attacked me, a young man who wounded me. If someone who kills Cain is punished seven times, then the one who kills me will be punished seventy-seven times. Okay, cool story, dude. Question. Why would someone who killed Cain be punished seven times? Well, because God said so. That's the mark of Cain. That's the promise to him. That he won't just be murdered for the sin of killing Abel. That anyone who would take up arms against Cain will be punished sevenfold. So what is Lamech trying to do here? Aside from supposedly creeping out his wives by just coming home one day and saying, Hey, I killed a guy. Good for you, honey. Dinner's almost ready. Do we think that this works? That Lamech can just declare himself off? Um, shoot, can't think of the word. That he can just declare himself safe? That he can just make this declaration? Well, someone who kills me will be punished 77-fold. I don't think so. He doesn't have the promise of God behind him. You can't just go murdering willy-nilly and expecting the same special clause from God provided to this one guy. But again, it's the arrogance of man. It's the sand building, again. The thinking that you can create something of your own to build independently from your creator God. To think that you know better, that you can do out and do best. And it's simply not true. And although hopefully most of us don't have the body count, that these people seem to accumulate, we are guilty of it. If I've heard it once, I've heard it a dozen times. Oh, our church has a lot of young people now. 
we need to start a youth group. Well, I'm sorry, what attracted the kids? Because I don't think it was the youth group, because it doesn't exist yet. So what you were doing in your church is working perfectly fine to gather the attention of the young people. Why are you suddenly introducing a program? Why are you changing it? Why are you copying what worked in the 50s? What are you doing? Maybe, here's the thought, maybe just trust God. Maybe think that his way of doing church, that his gathering, his worship, is sufficient. That you don't need to be constantly building things of your own. That you don't need to reinvent the wheel every time. And it's something for us to always be careful, to always watch out for, that we're not doing things our way. That we are not being unnecessarily extravagant. I talk about, well, no, let me do some more scripture next. To just kind of reinforce the point, we'll go to the book of Psalms, chapter 127. Some more very familiar scripture this morning. Psalms 127 and 1. Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with centuries would do no good. It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night. Anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to his loved ones. Like I said, I enjoy exploring some of the forgotten corners of history out here in Nevada. I was up in Virginia City the other day, taking that old dirt road that overlooks the train track. And I saw us sitting up on the hill, pretty cool, wooden cross. We got a lot of those out here. Apparently a lot of churches without much better to do than just stick a bunch of crosses up on the hills. Which is cool. We should do that sometime. Except we'd get shot at for trespassing. Not important. I decided, okay, I've got hours before I gotta be at work. Might as well. Took the quick hike up to go see this wooden cross. Because it's just cool. Stand up there with all the beautiful spring colors, enjoying the fresh air, God's presence. The act of this church to put a cross to mark God's kingdom. Really hoping that I don't step on a beehive or a rattlesnake or anything like that. Went up, enjoyed my quiet time. Got back in my car, continued on the way. Literally a mile further down the same road, another cross literally right next to the pavement with a bench right next to it so you can comfortably sit and enjoy the same thing that I just spent an hour climbing a hill to do. Sometimes, humans like to make things way more complicated than they need to be. I mean, I enjoyed the hike, but come on, right there. Sometimes we do need to trust God, to just give it to Him, to rely on the Master Builder, as Donut Man would say, to go His way, to listen to Him, to build on that stone foundation. Because God himself is a builder. Obviously, creator, king of the universe. I probably emphasize that point every other sermon, which means I emphasize it half as much as I need to. <laughs> One more set of scripture. John chapter 14, I think. <laughs> Let me look it up. Yep, John 14, starting in verse 1 again. 14 and 1. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God and trust also in me. There is more than enough room in my Father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I am going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and get you, so that you will always be with me where I am. What an interesting thought. That he's up there building something. <laughs> I won't pretend to have an answer for this. This is beyond my understanding. I have no idea what he's doing up in heaven to prepare it for us. Because it's heaven? <laughs> I wasn't aware it needed a new coat of paint or an extra bedroom or two. I don't know. All I know is I read that and I don't think God's standing idly by. I mean, of course he's not. But he's working, he's building, he's constructing, he's preparing the eternal home for his people. Well, obviously, 
If God's going to put in a 9 to 5 or we probably should too. We should work just as hard as we can on this world to prepare his kingdom. To make it worthy of that mansion he builds for us. As the psalm says. To strive to put in the effort to construct something great. Because yeah, may maybe it will be forgotten to time. There's plenty of old churches standing out there in those ghost towns as well. Some of the most famous, impressive cathedrals and churches of the Middle Ages are lost and gone. Notre Dame, the most recent, particularly hard-hitting one. Reconstruction efforts notwithstanding. But it's not about the physical buildings. Of course it isn't. The human experience is hardly ever about the physical buildings. We as a species are constantly building and building atop what came before. It's something, it's one of the few things I like about the progressive movement, meaning the early one from the early 1900s. The mostly fictitious idea that the human race was constantly getting better, that we were constantly evolving, that we were constantly getting greater. Pretty silly idea, right? Humans are humans. We're not any better now than we were generations ago. But the concept of having that optimistic world view is frankly something we should absolutely steal from them. This idea that we are building on what came before. That we are getting closer, ever closer, to Christ's returning. Again, you got to wonder sometimes what's taking him so long. Still working on that fresh coat of paint, I guess. But as long as we are here, and as long as we are building, and working. We might as well do it for him. We might as well continue to push forwards to make something new and something better, but still on that old foundation laid by Christ himself. That's the message this morning. To have any outstanding needs or requests before we dismiss? All right. If Joy would pray us out of here, Sister Joy. God, I love you. Thank you for the sermon and for bringing us all here safe. Bless the food and nourish it to our body and bring us safe home. Well, yes, sure. Home next week. Amen. 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 Works for me. <laughs> <laughs>